Welcome to Patient World. Today we're blessed to have with us a special guest, Dr. Sarah Nasir. Welcome to the show, Dr. Nasir. Thank you, Dr. Hester, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank Let's you. Let's get started by having you tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I am a doctor of osteopathy. I'm um, specialized in family medicine and currently I'm subspecializing in addiction medicine. Um, I've been doing this for about more than five years now and I've been taking care of patients largely who are suffering from the opioid dependence and addiction. Um, but I've also taken care of patients with alcohol use disorder, benzodiazepine use disorder, methamphetamine use disorder as well. Um, my career, uh, the highlights have been that I've had the um, opportunity to serve um, many underserved populations, including people um, who are um, housing insecure. And currently I'm working in a methadone clinic locally and I'm getting ready to also launch my practice that's going to go hand in hand with my coaching services. So that's uh, about me in a nutshell career wise. Personally, I'm a mom of two. I have a four-year-old girl and a boy who's about to turn two in two days. So that's me. Thank you. You have your hands full. I love what you do. It is Thank so you. very neat. <clears throat> Thank you. Heart for people. Thank you. So what would you like to tell the audience today? Yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity to come because I want to tell the audience today something I encounter so frequently behind closed doors and I often wish like I wish more people knew about it. So me being able to serve my patients would be easier. Right. So as an osteopathic physician, my philosophy of medical practice is one of holistic background. So that means um, the tenets of osteopathy, there is a four tenets and the ones that are the most powerful to me are the ones that says that the body is a unit it's made up of mind body and spirit and so the next tenet is that the body has the ability to heal itself so as healers our job is to help support the body take care of itself so um, that's how i proceed and when I meet my patients who are suffering from addiction and uh, what I encounter is that oftentimes, you know, um, the other dimensions of our health aren't in alignment. So people are probably just chasing the physical health when they talk about coming to the doctor. We think about labs, prescriptions, surgeries, different interventions, and oftentimes, um, that balance and that connection between these other elements, including the mind and the spirit. And I've added a few more dimensions to it, uh, which to me are the social and the financial support system as well. Uh, those aren't optimized. So one aspect of your existence will impact the health of the other dimensions of you. And so oftentimes when my patients come to me, um, there are certain misconceptions or prejudice or stigma that they encounter out in the public amongst their loved ones, as well as some that they harbor themselves. And so tackling these stigma is what I would love to do on the show today. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Thank you. I want to give a little bit of background because a lot of people don't understand DO. Um, so people are more used to MD. Uh, medical doctor, but I just want to clarify that DOs, they're also physicians. You know, I was a, a hospital-based doctor. Uh, some of the people, some of the doctors in the intensive care unit were DOs, some were MDs. And so while there are, are some differences, basically we're all physicians. And so I just wanted to just throw that out there in case some people don't fully understand the difference. Mine says MD, my name says MD, yours says DO. Yeah. But we can do the same, you know, we basically have the same source of training. Exactly. Um, and we can do the, you know, the same sorts of things. Yeah. So you go for it and let's tackle that stigma. Thank you. And I really appreciate 
the time to make that clarification because as you mentioned, our training is basically the same. Um, we can become surgeons and do surgery and I'm actually dual board certified in both osteopathic and the allopathic branch as well to show like it's so like it's, it's possible to do both. Um, so I really appreciate that clarification. So coming back to my message, what I would love for everybody to know and understand that addiction, it might start out as an escape mechanism or some sort of recreational mechanism from previous trauma or just trying new things in life, it can be a chronic disease, right? And so it's not necessarily that um, it's only moral problem, that there's something wrong with the person morally. There is a lot of change that happens physically, chemically, structurally even, right? And that's basically what happens in any disease like diabetes or stroke. You're fine one day, you are walking along, your body's functioning, compensating, trying to keep you alive until something in that system falls through. And then the imbalance, the dysfunction comes in. And if that continues, and if that is not corrected to return you to baseline, a disease starts to happen. So with um, addiction, and I'm going to focus on the opioid addiction more because that is one that I'm dealing more with and kind of the main concept behind it kind of applies to other addictions as well, substance use addictions as well. Um, so I'm going to focus on one just to keep things simple. So when you start to expose your body to an exogenous or artificial or something that doesn't naturally happen in your body, a chemical that's coming from outside, your body starts to change itself to go back towards that balance or scientifically speaking, homeostasis, right? And <clears throat> When it's happening so much and so consistently that it starts to look like the normal to the body, then your body starts to shift and recalibrate itself, kind of like the thermostat, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you can have one temperature inside the house, um, but if you want to have your house always at a certain set temperature, you go to the thermostat and you say, I want the house to be always at 65 degrees or 70 degrees. And so your brain does that resetting also. And this is a, a protective mechanism. This is a an adaptation mechanism that allows us to be the amazing creation and creatures that we are. It allows us to survive and adapt to nature. And so opioids, you know, the chemicals that are affiliated and coming into our bodies, they're not naturally occurring, but they're coming and binding to receptors where natural hormones, and there are chemicals too, they come and they bind. So normally we have hormones like endorphins that are naturally released by our body, our brain, when it wants to give us some sort of reward, um, you know, feelings, like something good happens in your life, um, you get a promotion or you, you know, over, you bench press and lift that like big pound that you're trying to do. Um, or you hear a good news, somebody you love comes in front of you. Um, so those are all feel good reward hormones. And that's one of the times when the endorphin is released. Um, and so what they do is they go and they bind to the receptors in the body that's called the opioid receptors. There are different types, but we'll keep things simple and just say opioid receptors. And <clears throat> when the endorphin and the opioid receptors attach, I'm going to bring up my arm. So these are neurons. And then at the other end comes all of these like dopamines. Those are your feel good hormones. They go, they make you feel euphoria or joy, and they can also reduce your pain perception they're basically your feel good hormones. And so what happens is when you have these external opioids like heroin, Percocet, hydrocodone, uh, oxycodone, fentanyl, uh, with, and heroin, when that gets introduced into the body in a chronically, chronical, what am I trying to say? Um, in a chronic way, that is always around, your body starts to slowly pull away those receptors that are available, right? So there's less seats on the bus. So what happens is you need to then start putting in more 
extra chemicals to compete for the limited seats available. Um, and the other thing that happens, your body doesn't want you to die from overdosing and your body doesn't want you to be checked out at all times. It wants you to be in the driver's seat, right? Because if you get into an accident, then it's going to be threatened. So it wants you to be aware and alert all the time. And so um, it wants you to, it starts to make less of those natural endorphins, right? So slowly as this continues to happen over weeks, months, years, you know, your body starts to become more and more permanent and in that diseased state where it's not making enough endorphins and it's not having enough seats available and open. So what might have started out as a choice once upon a time now becomes a need for survival. So if you are one of them who is struggling with this, or if you have somebody in your circle that you're aware of, you know, one of the things that my patients struggle with is that understanding that positive social influence, because um, what we see is that when the patients go into withdrawal, right, if they don't have these opioids in their system, then I like to use the example of a ground, so most of us that have normal um, system and our opioid and endorphins and receptors are all set, it's kind of like we're standing on a stable ground, right? But once you start to introduce the opioids more and more, it's like there's a hole that gets deeper and deeper. So <clears throat> this hole can not be closed by the body naturally anymore after a while. Right. So if you have this person, if you go up to them and you're like, if you love me, you'll kick this stuff. Right. What happens is you're telling them that they what's the word like many things happen. But what I'm trying to say is that when they're down here and their body's not able to stabilize them and bring them back, they go through significant withdrawal symptoms. It feels almost like dying or worse. So if they look angry to you, anxious to you, they look miserable to you, uh, normally the ones that we see are they're just cranky, they're just miserable, right? But inside they are hurting, they actually feel a lot of pain, their nose is running, they can't sleep, um, their guts are running. So basically they're in a state of severe misery because their body is no longer able to stabilize them. So in that situation, um, support them. Um, the best thing to do at that time is to help them close that gap chemically so they can get other things in their life to turn their life around and get those lifestyle changes in place that will support them as the treatment, because we now do have medicines that we use to close this gap artificially. Um, but under a supervised physician or a nurse practitioner or any sort of provider that's trained to do this. Um, you know, we help them first stabilize, then allow them a therapeutic time so the body starts to realize that it's not going to all of a sudden face calamity again, right? So the body needs time to change its memory and rebuild new memories to move towards progress. What I like to say, to go from a survival mode to a recovery mode. There is a time that's needed. So that's the time where you, the person who's suffering from this and the loved ones who are around this person, your job is to work on finding that support system that puts you further and further away from the temptations and move towards a positive aspect of your life that's going to help you move forward. Right. And so if you are an employee, if you're listening to this and you're somehow related to a sober living facility, um, one of the best things you can do is encourage the person. And if you're the person themselves, like allow yourself to be OK with getting help. OK, so that is the message that I want to say that if you get the help for re overcoming recovery, through pharmacological means, meaning through medicines. It is not something where you're 
um, switching one addiction for another addiction. It's you're getting the treatment you need to overcome the disease that you're suffering from. Dr. Michelle, that is one of the best explanations. Oh, thank you. Very, very thorough, but you could imagine it and you could envision it. And you just really made it thank you. Extremely well. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, um, I think one of the big <clears throat> things I tell my patients is find the sun in your horizon, right? And I think that is the biggest magnet that helps um, the patients move forward and out of this hole because it's hard to climb out of the hole if all you're focusing on is getting out of the hole. But if you have something bigger, bigger than um, the stars in the sky, whatever else is on the horizon, something big that you know after a storm and after the night, it'll be back and you'll find your direction again. Find it. And that sun is a purpose, a goal, something big. Like I want to get a degree or I want to buy a house or I want to have a job. You know, I want to find my significant other. I want to have a kid. I want to see my grandkids grow up right and it's something concrete is there you, you know and it keeps you moving forward and that's what i tell my patients and i think a lot of times when i explain it that way and i help them identify you know what are the big motivations that they're working towards um it makes it worthwhile you know to climb out of the moment and keep moving forward thank you I would really love if you are interested in, um, you know, getting more help with finding your purpose, finding the sun in your horizon, so you can continue to come out of it. I have a, I have recently founded a coaching company called Transcendent You, and that means that you're somebody who is willing to transcend your limits to become somebody who lives their purpose has a full life if you're able if you're interested in that i would love to work with you i have a website called uh, i'm going to spell it out <laughs> i shortened it is bit bit dot ly slash transcendent and it's spelled t-r-a-n-s-c-e-n-d-a-n-t because anybody who transcends their limits i want to help them become a transcendent like almost like a confidant, like it's a person who transcends. And give us that. Um, sure. Bitly, B I T dot L Y slash T R A N S E N D A N T, transcendent. Thank you. That sounds great. Thank you so very much. And we're also going to have um, that in the description to this podcast. So thank you again so much for this invaluable information. As you know, addiction just destroys so many people, so many families. And to have a shining light, a way to get from you know, the thunderstorm to the other side, the rainbow, that you know. How thank you. Happens. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this knowledge. I think it's, you're right, it is, um, it's such a heartbreaking disease, but it's not recognized that way. But fortunately, we're at a cusp of time where things are turning around because most of the patients are victims, victims to people who only care about their money and not their lives. And so, you know, if you're a provider, connect to somebody, connect, help your patient connect to the right help as well. It's a new day for health and wellness, and it begins at Patient World. Empower yourself with fun and engaging on-demand courses taught by doctors and other experts at patientworld.net today.